what was Satan tempting Jesus with? That's what we'll talk about in Matthew 4. So we start off Matthew 4 a year later after Jesus was baptized. Of course, there's no calendars, but it's just an estimate of how much time has passed. We're initially told that the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. That's a little quote. It's just that sometimes when we do the will of God, sometimes we do what the Holy Spirit is leading us to do, we're tempted. That's how it goes. And in this case, he ended up fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. The number 40 comes up a lot of times in the Bible. I believe it's 159 times. It tends to be meaning a longer period of time of distress or suffering of some kind, but as part of God's plan. Moses fasted for 40 days. Elijah fasted for 40 days. People were in the ark for 40 days and 40 nights. So you can see the, those strings between those times. Then the devil, the tempter, comes to Jesus and says, hey, you look hungry. Obviously, he's been fasting for 40 days. People feel that that's pretty much the extent of how much you can go without food without dying. So yes, hungry. Turn these stones into loaves of bread. This is the second time we've seen turning stones into something. John the Baptist said, I'm going to turn stones into the sons of Abraham. Now we're going to turn these stones into bread. The first temptation is that of bodily need. We need water. We need sleep. We need food. We need shelter. You know, those are things that we desperately need to just stay alive. But then Jesus replies that man shouldn't live on bread alone but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. That's ESV. So when we're tempted in the physical body by things that our body just needs to live, it's a different temptation than us doing something for kicks. Now we're just trying to survive. It says the devil took Jesus to the top of the holy city. It's not like the devil is dragging Jesus there. The devil has no power to take Jesus any place he doesn't want to go. But he says, you know, if you're the son of God, Satan knew this is the son of God, but just saying as part of you being a son of God, you know, if you throw yourself down off the top of the temple, Josephus indicated it was about 450 feet high, then the angels will catch you. They'll bear you up to prevent your very foot from striking the stone. So now he's giving Jesus this opportunity to have a spectacle to go to Jerusalem, to go to the highest place in the temple, on top of the temple. Who goes on top of the temple? And then throw yourself off and then have angels save you. Remember now, Satan was an angel, so he knows what angels were meant to do. And again, this is something where we don't put God to the test. But in Malachi 3.10, it says that we can put God to the test by giving so much and why is it two different things? One, we shouldn't put God to the test. And then the other is test God. And one of them is this was done in Egypt. He's referring back to Exodus where the people of Israel demanded God give them water. Do it now. Give us water right now. This is an angry situation where they're demanding from God as compared to living in faithfulness and saying, try it out. See what happens. So this is a bad kind of test. And again, Jesus is like, I'm not going to do it. We don't test the Lord. Then the last test was to take him to the highest place on earth. So then Satan takes Jesus to a very high place. And people think, again, they know where it is. No one knows for sure. And showed him the whole world, all the kingdoms of the world. And says, you know what? I will give you all of this if you will worship me. Which is ridiculous. It's not Satan's to give. He has no power to give it. But here's the temptation. You're wondering, this is kind of ridiculous. Why would this happen? What he's really offering is a shortcut. Jesus already owns the world. The question is, does he have to go through all the suffering? Jesus knows what's coming. He's going to suffer for his people. He's going to lay his life down for his people. And in the process, it will redeem us all, eventually leading to the end of Satan. So what Satan is offering him is a shortcut. Do this. And then you will be done with it. I'll give you everything right now. And then you won't have to worry about all this pain that you're going to have to go through. Instead, you're going to be able to get things right away. So it was a temptation of not having to do the process, not going through the things that were written about and not doing God's will 
Satan can't offer these things. But again, if we don't have the death of Jesus to pay for our sins, then the sins will never be forgiven. We are now in a permanent state of no forgiveness. We can't be perfect on one hand, and on the other side, we can't have our sins paid for. So now we're doomed. So this was really a temptation that was going to shortcut everything for us. And so Jesus at this point is ready to be done with Satan and tells him, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only you shall serve. That's Deuteronomy 6.13. And that was the end. The devil left him. The angels came and ministered to him. But now we're going to see Jesus start his own ministry. He hears that John the Baptist was arrested and he goes to Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, where he's from, he moves to Capernaum. And Capernaum is an interesting place because, first of all, it's a bustling town. The Sea of Galilee is a freshwater lake. And when you're living in a desert, a big, beautiful freshwater lake, that's important. And so it had fish. And that means that the town had an industry. And so it became a crossroads. There were a lot of Jews living there, but there were a lot of Gentiles living there. It was also a high trade place. And of course, as you can imagine, because it was making money, the Romans would be there too. They're excited to collect taxes on all that beautiful fish money. And I think what's interesting too is what does Jesus do in those temptations to defeat Satan? Is he keeps the word of God in his head and on his mouth, he speaks the word of God in each case. And so that I think brings us to that idea of reading God's word, which we're doing now, and then memorizing key passages so that the word of God is right there at the tip of our tongue when we're being tempted by Satan, when we're tempted to do the wrong thing. We have God's word right there available to us so that we can just utter the words that chases Satan away. Then Jesus goes from Nazareth, where he grew up, to Capernaum. Now, Capernaum is about 27 miles right now by car, drives about nine hours because of the route and, you know, towns and everything else like that. But back in those days, it was 40 miles. So you fish to make money to pay the taxes. To me, it's interesting because I'm not much of a desert person. I'm from the North Woods. I love forests and trees and lush and green. And you go to Israel and it is so deserty, rocks and this rough wilderness. There are places with oases, there's lakes, there's waterfalls in various locations. But the Sea of Galilee is just amazing. I could see why this was a bustling area. And then we get to Capernaum. This is a big town, hub of trade and all sorts of things. I'm sorry, I miss this town when I was there. I saw parts of the Sea of Galilee, but I never went to Capernaum because my grandmother was trying to send me to Israel. And part of the time I was with her and the part of the time when I was in this area, I was with her. She was not interested in going to Christian sites. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. So I never saw Capernaum. I wish I had. But the relics, the images that you can see on the Internet of the archaeology, it's amazing. They discovered 15 different harbors, fishing harbors from the time of Jesus have been discovered along the lake. And one of them, people believe, was Peter's. They said that tilapia was the main commercial fish of this time. But, you know, things pass down in a very orderly way when you live in a small town. Who lived where and the lore of the local town stays alive a bit more than it does here. But now we're in Capernaum. And like I said, this is a crossroads. To me, I always wondered why Jesus picked the Galilee area, Capernaum, because obviously Jerusalem is the big place where you're going to get seen. You're going to get access to a lot of eyeballs if you just do things in big cities. Why not go there? Why go all the way out into the wilderness, past the wilderness, and to the Sea of Galilee? And to me, it indicates more of what Jesus is doing in his ministry. He is preaching to everybody, and Galilee is a crossroads. It is not under the thumb of the temple. It's not under the thumb of the Romans in the way that Jerusalem is. Instead, it is a place that you can see many, many people and get access to many people from many civilizations right there. Josephus said that the area was 60 by 30 miles and that there were 204 villages and about 15,000 people that lived there. It was also 
a majority of people who lived in this area, even though it was part of the 12 tribes land given to Israel, many Gentiles, meaning non-Jewish people one way or the other. So he goes to Capernaum and makes this his home. And he even checks another box off because he's going to say that this is part of Isaiah 9, 1 through 2. The land of Zebulun, in the land of Nepali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. And for those dwelling in the region and the shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. Jesus being the light. So he's checking off another box. Then his ministry begins. He starts to preach in the town. And what's the very first thing he says? Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So he starts off the same way John the Baptist was preaching to people too. And so while he's walking by the Sea of Galilee, which is what you do when you go into this area, it's so beautiful, he sees two brothers. One of them, Simon, who's called Peter, we're going to know a lot about him, and Andrew, his brother. And they were casting nets into the sea as fishermen. We know that. We know that they were both fishermen. And Jesus says something. I always loved how he says it. Follow me. You're going to see Jesus say, follow me so many times, but follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. He talks to people where they're at. That's what I love about that phrase. They would understand immediately. You're going to throw your nets out and instead of getting fish, you're going to get people. I think that's the best way to reach them. And it says immediately they followed him. So they dropped everything. They continued on seeing James and John, and they were in a boat and they were fixing nets. So again, he calls to them, probably says, follow me. And immediately they left the boat and followed him. We have four apostles as part of Jesus' group. Charles Spurgeon brought up this interesting point. He says, quote, God usually calls people as they were busy doing something. Jesus called the apostles as they were casting nets or mending their nets. They were busy in a lawful occupation when he called them to be ministers of our Lord. He does not call idlers, but fishers. And then brought up the other point that Saul was looking after his father's donkey in the Old Testament. David was keeping his father's sheep. Amos was farming. Matthew was working as a tax collector. Moses was tending to his father-in-law's sheep. And Gideon was thrashing wheat. So these are all worker people that get called by God to do his will. So now he goes throughout Galilee area and he starts teaching in the synagogues and proclaiming the good news, the gospel of the kingdom. He healed disease. He healed people who were being oppressed, they say, by demons and having seizures. And as he was healing people, he was also teaching, like it said, and people from all over the area, including Syria, brought the sick to him to get people of various sufferings cured. And it said the crowds just started following him. It was people from that area, people from the Decapolis, people from Jerusalem and Judea, and it says beyond the Jordan. So out east, beyond the land of Israel. And that ends Matthew 4. So when did the dates take place? This was about a year after the part where John was baptizing Jesus. This takes place initially in the wilderness with the temptations and then. We go to Jerusalem and the high place during the temptations. Then Jesus leaves Nazareth, goes to Capernaum in the north part of the Sea of Galilee. People we see in this chapter are Jesus. We hear mention of John the Baptist. We don't see him. We have the devil, Peter, Andrew, James, and John, son of Zebedee, and the crowd. And not only was the crowd growing, but it was made up of people from every walk of life, from Judea, from Jerusalem, from Syria, from out west, from out east of the Jordan River, people were coming from all directions to hear the word of Jesus and be healed. And some key concepts in this chapter were fasting, temptation, this concept of the wilderness. We see preaching, healing, the calling of the disciples. And then we also see the concept of 40 days and 40 nights, meaning a long time of maybe pain and suffering or hardship at least, but being as part of God's plan. And the literary tools in this particular piece is just telling of what happened. We see Jesus using quotes from God's word to take down the devil. We also see Jesus use an illusion 
to Andrew and Peter become fishers of men, which is something that they would understand. The big thing that we see is Satan uses the words of God and tries to take them out of context. So we have to be careful because we know Satan is the exact opposite of God in every way, wants exactly the wrong things, but he knows scripture just as well as anyone, probably better than we know. And so he can take them, pull out a quote and twist it. So Satan's great at it. And he will use that technique with us. He used it against Eve and Eve failed. Jesus took that same temptation and won. So the question is that can we know the scripture so well so that we don't fall into the hands of Satan or go down his path? When we know something is very clearly wrong, we know to avoid it. And so what does this chapter say about the nature of God? It shows, first of all, that God understands temptation. We feel sometimes that God doesn't understand what we're going through. He lives in his high places and he just doesn't understand how hard it is to be here. But this is the point we're getting. Jesus came to earth and was tempted. This was a real temptation, even though the outcome was always known. And we understand that the way to get around the temptation is to live off of the word of God. Satan's goal was to deny the world from a savior. But because Jesus overcame the temptation, we have a savior. But he knows what we're going through because he lived it himself. He lived out hunger. He lived out poverty. He lived out temptation. We also see that he's checking prophecies off the list. He's going through them one by one and making sure they are all accomplished. And then the last part we know about God is he saw the suffering of people from illnesses, from suffering, from health problems, and from satanic influences. So Jesus went out not just telling people about the kingdom of God, but by curing their immediate physical needs, by curing the things that is causing them suffering. Jesus does care about that. So it would be easy to see if God walked around and saying, hey, I know you're this hurts and you're that hurts, but what's important here is your salvation. Absolutely true. The salvation is the most important thing, but he also cares about what happens to us here and the suffering that happens right now. What does this book chapter say about our human nature? It shows us that we have many woes. We have illnesses. We have temptations. We have suffering inflicted by demons. And even though the eternal kingdom is of his utmost mind, he still cares about the suffering that's happening in the here and now. And people will go a great distance in order to get relief. Travel was dangerous back then. The people came from faraway places in order to get what they needed. And what they needed was a Savior who cares about them. What's the central message of what God is trying to preach? Which is clearly the first thing he says is repent. We need to live off of what he says every word from God's mouth. Repent means we're going to turn back. We're going to turn away from our sins. We're going to go the other direction. But the temptations show us that we should not give in to temptation because of our human need, because of our desire to be seen by the people as special, or to be offered power by Satan. We also don't tempt the Lord. If you don't give me X, I'm not going to believe you. And we should avoid any shortcut or avoiding God's pain in what God told us to do because God will give us what we need in eternity. The words of God can drive off the devil. We've seen that. And we should take note that the devil uses scripture, knows it very well. Again, he was an angel. He understands it. But because Jesus overcome those temptations with the word of God, we should also do the same. And so what does God require for us? First of all, he requires us to repent the first words of his ministry, the same words that came out of John the Baptist, meaning He wants us to turn away from what we're doing against God's law, but he also wants us to bring our suffering, our pain, our illnesses to him because he is compassionate. My meditation this week is going to be about God taking care of our immediate needs, our physical needs right now, but also we're about to verge on our spiritual needs when he talks about the Sermon on the Mount and how we see God taking care of our physical needs. 
and my prayer is for people to see Jesus as he really is and what it means for him to be here on earth with us through temptation, through the suffering we're going to see, for Jesus to be here on this planet, that God cares about us so much that he's going through all of this. Hope people know the degree to which God cares and loves us. And of course, what I will continue to share is that God came here in person, faced temptations, faced the things that we face on a daily basis so that he could love us, understand us, and be in our spot. All right, that's going to wind us up for Matthew 4. We are going to get into the real meat of things in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. They're dense. So you might want to start reading this one a little early. There's a lot there. Thank you all very much for listening. I hope you're enjoying this. Please again, let me know. You can email me at jill at smallstepswithgod.com and let me know what you think. Let me know how to pray for you or let me know if there's any sort of tool or something I could be doing that would help you study the scripture better. Keep in mind that these podcasts are gonna be of varying lengths. Depending on the length of the passage we cover, the details in the passage, we are about to hit the Sermon on the Mount. It is dense. There's a lot of detail in the next three chapters. So they'll be a little bit longer, but then we're gonna go through and have some shorter episodes as well. Thank you very much for listening.